Now I'd really like to welcome Lorraine Cross, who's our wonderful social worker at the MARTA. I'm sure a lot of you have met her. She's been a huge advocate for patients over the years, um, patients especially diagnosed with brain cancer, especially um, this role not being existent uh, before a year ago. So she was really the go-to person. So we're just so thankful to have her here today and to help organise. Um, so welcome, Lorraine. Now, it's always um, very uh, difficult coming after someone who's a fantastic speaker like Ben. And I'm going to probably speak more to the slides. I'm not going to talk so much about my role. I'll give you a brief overview. I do work at the MARTA. I've worked there for 21 years. I've worked with cancer patients for 21 years. And since 1998, when we started the first brain tumour support group in Newcastle, and pretty well in, in the state, um, I've had an interest in brain tumours. I thought what I would briefly look at with you today is things that I'm consistently asked which are about finances. Now these are the, the concerns. Once you get your diagnosis and your treatment and you're in a state of shock, I think the next level is how does my life progress? How does my life go on normally? So the things people always look at are job security, versus Centrelink entitlements. And if any of you here have been to Centrelink, you know that's a nightmare. Negotiating with the bank free um, mortgage payments, um, which is a good thing, and we can provide documentation from your specialists if that's necessary. Most banks don't want it, but it is uh, obtainable. Looking at mortgage insurance. Um, mortgage is today usually have to have insurance, uh, and it's, it's at activating your mortgage insurance. Accessing superannuation. Now, most superannuation funds you can access through a compassionate um, aspect of your super fund, but you can access it for palliative care, for modifications to the house. If the bank's going to foreclose on your mortgage, if you need um, uh, equipment or treatment that's not available in the public health system, it's that a little easier to get uh, hold of your superannuation. Now, getting legal advice and uh, financial advice, the New South Wales Cancer Council does offer free legal and free financial advice. Now, the legal advice is more to do with wills, power of attorney and um, guardianship. It's not to do for family law. But to access that particular service, you have to be in receipt of Centrelink benefits in the main. So if you're still a wage earner, it's a little difficult to get hold of that particular free service. Um, wills, power of attorney and guardianship, there's something that we all should have at any stage of our life, I guess, once we start having debts, once we start buying a home, once we have children. They are the things we look at, should be looking at, but I can tell you most people don't look at those until they have a crisis. So Centrelink, I'm continually asked about carers' payments because when the wage earner or one of the wage earners is looking at changes to finance, people ask, how do they get on a carer's um, payment? So I've put there what the Centrelink definitions because the language on the paperwork is quite complex. The carer's payment is for someone who's personally providing constant care. Now, what they don't really say, but it comes up in the, in the language, I think, of frail age. You get these payments if you are providing care for someone and keeping them out of a care facility, basically. And that particular care has to be provided for a, a, a minimum of six months. The person that you're caring for and you must meet the income and assets test. You are not to be absent from the role for um, more than 25 hours in a uh, week. And you can't receive the carer's payment if you're getting an aged benefit at the same time. The carer's allowance is not taxable or income or assets tested and can be paid in addition to wages, but you've got to meet the criteria. And the criteria is based on the ADAT determination, which is all in legislation. 
Now, there's the, the questionnaire that has to be completed by the carer has also got to be completed by a health professional. So there are two components. There's one multi-page document for the doctor to fill in, because it has to be a doctor, um, or one for the family and or the patient to fill in. Now, don't ever fill in yours before you get the medical professional to fill theirs in, because if they don't line up, you've got yours, mine and Buckley's of getting the benefit. So you go to the doctor first, you get them to fill in their medical assessment of the patient, and then you fill yours in. Now, this includes routine personal activities. So if you are driving the patient to appointments because they're no longer allowed to drive, if you're taking more kids, care of the kids, if you're doing more domestic services, um, if you're doing more of all the things you would have done perhaps as a couple, that doesn't count. What it means is care is personal care. So it means dressing a person, undressing a person, showering them, um, doing their hair, doing their teeth, feeding them and toileting them, getting them in and out of bed. That's what constitutes care. There's the, the carer's allowance... Um, no, I... Now, there's got to be the medical report. Now, in the medical report, there is question seven, question eight, question nine, which can be quite confronting, especially for, I think, brain... Question seven describes the disability. Is it terminal, permanent or temporary? To get on the carer's um, payment quicker, if terminal or permanent are ticked, you get the payment much quicker. If, unfortunately, temporary is ticked, then you've got to answer all the other questions which mean hands-on care, the hands-on care you provide. Question eight, of course, is incredibly confronting to see uh, on a piece of paper with a tick. Uh, is the person going to live more than three months? If the answer is yes, you're less likely to get the carer's benefit through quickly. If the no is ticked, you're more likely to get into the system. It's legislation and it's paper, so whatever the box that's ticked, you have to try and step aside and think that if they don't tick some of these confronting boxes, it's going to be much more difficult for you to get a benefit. Question 13 is all about, as I said, the hands-on care. So question 13 covers dressing, undressing, bathing, feeding, grooming. And that's covered there. Now, all of these um, tasks are scored. They're scored out of 20, but it's an invisible score. I don't know, you don't know, but Centrelink knows. So if you go through and answer the questions on your form that says, yes, my family member can get in and out of bed, so you've ticked the independent. The next question you've ticked, they need the assistance of one, and you keep going through all these questions. If there are too many independents that you have ticked, and too many independents that the doctor's ticked, you don't get the benefit. The person has to be fairly dependent on the care you're providing. The health care card. Many people, if they can't get a carer's um, or a disability support, would like a health care card because of the um, medication. You can apply for that separately. Um, that, I'd have to leave you to look yourself because that's all to do with income. And that may be the income of the carer. It may be some assets of the, um, of the patient. But if you get knocked back with anything at Centrelink, there's an appeals officer. And you can ask to see the appeals officer or at least speak to the appeals officer. Disability support. Now, this would be in the case of the um, patient or the wage earner who no longer can work and needs some form of income. 
This particular payment um, is, uh, gives you some benefits with um, rates and um, give, would give you a healthcare card. The difficulty will be if there's another family member who's earning a wage. I can't tell you what that dollar cutoff is, but if there is more income coming into the family, it's less, uh, you're less able to get hold of the um, disability support. Now, the doctor doesn't sign a form or tick a box form. They have to write a separate letter to get uh, a patient, patient on disability support. The letter has to say what the diagnosis is, what the prognosis is, uh, life expectancy, uh, change in function. Um, that now is, um, so it's prognosis, whether the condition's going to improve, um, and the impact of the symptoms and um, probably the treatment, but also the changes in um, the, the impact, the functional impact are the most important. Now, I just wanted to mention this briefly. Um, I'm sure quite a few of you, and I know there's one person here, who, when the doctor tells you, and this could, you've got your GP, you've got your neurosurgeon, you've got your medical oncologist, you've got your radiation oncologist. So you've got all this team of medicos, they may not all say the same thing. Some may say you can drive, some may say you can't drive. It's not just to do with seizures. So if you have had, um, an, um, I guess, an assessment from the doctor about not driving, and they make a note on your medical file, and you drive against medical advice, you're not covered by insurance, Therefore, if you have an accident, you can be sued. If you feel that you do have the capacity to drive or your family member, uh, as your advocate, thinks you have the capacity to drive, you can seek an assessment from a driving occupational therapist. Now, not all occupational therapists can do the assessment, but they are listed on the website, on the um, OT, the Occupational Therapist of Australia or New South Wales, they're listed on that particular site. The only thing is that it's not covered by Medicare and it's not covered by private insurance. The last time I looked it was about $600 for the um, particular test. If you have um, an assessment from an OT, the way it works is an occupational therapist will go out in a dual control, control car with you once they've done an off-road assessment. Now, that assessment is not like the assessment you had when you were 17. It's just looking at your reflexes, your spatial awareness and your responses. Usually a couple of hours. Then they take you out in a dual control car with a driving instructor. And that is, uh, I think it might be 35, 45 minutes for that particular test. If you pass, then that OT can give you documentation to take back to your doctor if um, that gets you back behind the wheel. If you fail that particular test, you still have the option for working on the particular um, deficits the occupational therapist may have identified and you get a chance to do it again. That's the, um, just to give you a note about the um, RMS. The RMS is the Road and Motor Services that used to be RTA. And that's it.